Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jeremy Champa. Today we're going to be looking at practice test seven. We're going to be looking at some of the more difficult questions in the calculator section. And before we get started, let me just quick programming note. So we're going to have a screen share of the chalkboard, but the questions are not going to appear on the screen. And there's a couple reasons for that. The most important reason is that I want you to have the test open. I want to encourage you to be actively working on this material when you're using these videos. So if you've heard the spiel, you can fast forward, but if you haven't, the whole idea is we need to be active in our work. So we can't be just sitting back watching a video and expecting to learn anything. So I want you to pause the video a bunch of times, work on questions on your own, and use this video as a supplement to the work you'd be doing. So that's one of the reasons I'm not putting the pictures of the questions on the board. So I'll still show you my work on my chalkboard, but nonetheless, I'd like you to be doing the work alongside me, sort of in concert with me. So have a pencil, have a notebook, have the test open. Um, and with all that said, let's get started with the first question that I'm going to work on, which is number 21. Okay. So this question is a graph question, and whenever we see a graph question, we start at the very, you know, every time we see a word problem question, we're going to start at the end. Every time we see a graph question, we're going to pay attention to things like title and the two axes, um, as well as scale, because that's where the majority of the mistakes are. So the first thing I notice even before I get started with the reading is looking at the chart, I see kind of a strange scale, which is to say we can't trust the visual concept of this slope, which the slope looks pretty moderate on the page, but there's this stretchiness to the x values, right? Each of those lines on the grid represents 10 grams of protein. And then uh, total fat is the y-axis, but that's much smaller spaces for every increment of 10. So we have a one-to-one -one thing in terms of the grids each represent 10 units x and y, but the that's not um, proportionate, at least visually. So we can't trust that scale. Anyways, this question asks, for every increase in one gram of total protein, what is the predicted increase of total fat? Okay, so this is where you ground your work in the most accurate numbers that you have. So to me, the most accurate values, the numbers that are really close on the graph is maybe the, the point to the far left, which looks like x equals, I don't know, I'll write down, it's less than 10, but not much less than 10. I'll write down 9. And then the y value looks to be less than 20, but not much less than 20. So I'm going to call it like, uh, let's call it 17. x is 9, y is 17. As I'm saying that, I'm making sure that I'm not mixing up X and Y because that's where the mistakes can happen. Remember, anytime you're working on a question, you want to be as conscious as possible of the kind of mistakes that occur. You won't make those mistakes if um, you're hyper aware of them, or at least you have a better chance of not making those mistakes. So there's two points that are maybe even better than this. So I'm going to write down both of these other points. There's one where the X value is halfway between 30 and 40. That's x equals 35, and maybe y equals, I don't know, more than 55. I'll call it 57 for easier math, because that seems reasonable. Um, now, the reason I say this point seems even better is because it's directly in the middle of the line. The other point, 9 comma 17, is like just a little bit below the line. It's like on the line, but the point seems a little bit below. The other point that's absolutely perfect is x equals, I don't know, 43 maybe 44, I'll call it 44, and then y equals exactly 70. Um, those are really, it's good to have three points so that you can feel confident you, you don't have a single point of failure, that is to say. If you're comparing this stuff for three different points, then you've got maybe uh, an easier or a better chance of catching any mistakes you've made. So look, we're looking for the predicted increase in fat, so the amount that Y goes up for every increase in protein, which is the amount X goes up. So we have Y over X, AKA the slope. 
Well, let's look at the slope between these first two points. Um, I conveniently made both of the y values. You know, slope is y, the change in y, y2 over y1, minus, or I'm sorry, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So the way I tend to do that, just to avoid mistakes, is I tend to input um, both the y value and the x value for a given point. So I put the 57, the 35, a couple of minus signs, and then I put in the y value of 17 and the x value of 9. That's just a way of doing things slightly differently than we typically do them, and that leads to a more conscious effort. So you're not going to make a, an unconscious mistake. Okay, so that works out to, I guess, 40 over 35 minus 9 is like 26. And look, that's about 1.5. You could use your calculator for that. It's not 2. And it's, it's close to 2, but it's not quite 2. So 1.5 sounds pretty good there. Now you could use your calculator for that. I'm going to move on to testing these two points, these other two points. So down below, I have, I guess, I could put the 70 and the 44. So put the y and the x in. The minus minus now the y and the x fifty seven thirty five. Okay, so that's a change in y of I guess thirteen over a change in x, which is closer to I guess this is one point, or this is eleven. Okay, so um, with those two points, it's closer to one. So I'm a little bit skeptical of my math here. Let me make sure I've got this right. 70 makes sense. 70, 50, 70, 44, 57 as a value for when x is 35. All right, the thing is those really, that's that's really pretty accurate numbers. So the difference is going to be, look, I know this is one point something-ish, right? It's like one and two elevenths, which is like 0.2-ish. Um, but I'm going to try the third set, which is the comparison between 917 and 4470. Okay, so that difference is going to be, I'll do it up here, 70, put the 44 below, um, so y over x minus minus 17 is the y, 9 is the x. Okay, so here we have a difference of 53. And on the bottom, we have a difference of 35. Okay, so I guess, you know, I had done some math incorrectly down here. This was 13 over 11, which makes it closer to 1.5. So I made a mistake there, but I caught that mistake by trying out a third value because I'm thinking 53 over 35, that's definitely a lot closer to 1.5 than it is to 1. So this little mistake down here that I made with 44 minus 35, I caught that mistake by trying out a third set, right? So that's what I mean. That's kind of like, even though I made a mistake, I'm going to leave this in the video because I think it shows you how valuable it is to have multiple points of failure. I'm not going to lie to you and say I did it on purpose, but it worked out that way. Um, so multiple points of failure means that if you only if you make one mistake, you're likely to avoid picking the wrong answer with just a little bit more work. Okay, cool. So here's the thing. I didn't notice 44 minus 35 was 11 until I stepped away from it. Oftentimes you'll catch your mistakes with a little bit of distance, but you won't catch them when you're right in the middle of doing some work. That's why it's really useful to have other things to do other than stare at the same work you've just done. Oftentimes I say the best way to check your work is to do something different than what you did originally. That is, use the other answer choices. Ask yourself small questions about those answer choices, etc. Okay, moving on. Number 22. Let me clear the board here. Number 20. Oops. Number 22. Okay, so another big word problem, like a massive paragraph and some data. Um, what is the last sentence says, what is the difference between median percent of residents who earned a bachelor's degree or higher from the 17 states and the, or the seven states and the median for all 50 states? Okay, so we have seven states listed. So the median of that set would be the middle number. So look, that, that stuff is not in order. So what I'm going to do is try to group stuff. I see that EFG are in the 30s. 
thirties. And there's only those three, and then there's three in the twenties and one in the night in the one that's nineteen point five. So look, nineteen point five is the low one, and then I'm gonna find the highest value in the twenties. That's the middle term. Remember medium is middle. So like D is the lowest one, and then A and then C is at 25.9, B is 27.9, and then we have E, G, F. Not all that matters. What really matters is just B is in the middle. So there's the middle term, 27.9. The median for all 50 states is 26.95. Okay, so all we have to do is deduct the difference, and of course that's 0 0.95. Cool. Okay, so that's just about knowing what the median is, right? One last thing, if you had an even set, let's say that we had an H, what you would have to do is the middle would be halfway between B and E. You'd have to add these up and average them. If you have an even set, the median is the average of the middle two terms. Cool. All right, let's keep moving here. Um, now, if you wanted to check that work, you would look for what the other kinds of mistakes would be. I'm going to move on, however. Um, so we're looking at number 23 now. I put that on the board. 23. Um, again, with the word problems, 110 cubic centimeters of syrup is needed to fill the can to the top. Which of the following is closest to the total volume of the pieces of fruit in the can? All right, so here's your game. First of all, you notice I looked at the last sentence first. Then I'm looking at the answer choices to just see if I can find some relevant terms. Like, okay, I, my first thought has to do with the 75 and the 7.5. I also noticed 750, so there's a thing going on there. Um, I'm not really sure about the other numbers. I guess 640 is the, the difference between 750 and the number 110, which is listed in the problem. Right, so now I've just, I just wanted to get a sense of those ideas because when you've taken a survey of the answer choices, you've given yourself a chance to think about how to check your work other than just running over your work, like I said before. You don't want to just do the same thing twice. You want to use the answer choices as a way of checking your work that's different than what you did up front. So I've already got some ideas about the answer choices. I don't know what they mean, but that's okay. Look, we ha we're asking about volume. We have a base of a can, which has an area of 75. Now, volume of a, of a cylinder, can's a cylinder, would be something like the area of the base, which is pi r squared, times the height. Right, so I knew I drew it kind of crooked, but you get the idea. This is height. So pi r squared h equals the volume. So, all right, well, we know that pi r squared, which is the area of the bottom, is 75, and then the height is 10. So now I know that the total volume is 750. And look, we don't want the total volume of the can. We want the fruit in the can minus the syrup. So if the 750 is the total volume, and then there's 110 that's syrup, then the 640 is the other stuff. And that's what we're looking for, because all that's in this can is syrup and fruit. The, fruit's one, the fruit is the difference between the entire volume and the volume of the other stuff, syrup. Right, so that leaves 640 that must be the fruit. Now, I guess I don't really understand where 185 comes from, and that's okay because as a test taker, I understand most of the other answers. If I'm trying to move fast on number 23, I wouldn't sit there and critically analyze 185. I'm sure we could figure it out where the heck it's coming from. Maybe you have an idea. I don't know, is that halfway? No, it's not halfway between. Is it? Oh, it's adding 110 and 75. That doesn't make sense, though. That's adding the base of the bottom of the can to the syrup. And so, okay, I know where they all come from. I'm moving on. Um, number 24 is the next question. So here we go with 24. It's a question about a um, quadratic function, a function that deals with parabolas. Um, things you should be able to see about this is that it's steep and it opens down because it has this negative 60 in t squared. The middle term's less valuable up front, um, this positive 110t, but the 72 is valuable because this is the y-intercept. 
That is, when t, or you know, the x value, the input value equals 0, the output, which is h here, this h of t equals all of this, h would be equal to that 72. So look, they want to know what the number 72 represents in the function. Start by being a wise ass. It's the y-intercept, or the uh, value of h when uh, t equals 0. Right, so the value of h when t equals zero. So h is height, so it's the height at time zero. Zero seconds. So height at zero seconds. Okay, initial height makes sense then. Max height? Maybe so, maybe not. But look, a parabola goes like up and down. We could figure out what the max height is if you weren't absolutely sure that it's the initial height. Where we start is time equals zero. So that's why the right answer is going to be A. But look, I mentioned that this middle term wasn't immediately useful. This is the form AX squared plus BX plus C. Now the quadratic formula uses those terms. Negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. You could use the quadratic formula, parts of it, to figure out other things about the parabola. Negative B over 2A, that is negative this thing, over 2 of this thing equals the x coordinate of the vertex, in this case the t coordinate of the vertex. And if we know that the parabola opens down, what we're talking about is what is the time value here? So that won't tell you directly the height, but that will tell you the time at which the height is maximized. And at that point you could figure out what the h is by just plugging in t equals that value. Right? This is called the vertex. So you could go figure that out. It would be like negative 110, I'm sorry, yeah, negative 110, negative B over negative 1, let me write that better, negative 110 over 2 times negative 16, which is negative 32. So whatever that gross number is, I don't think that's an easy, nice number. Um, 96, yeah, it's not a nice number, but um, either way, yeah, you could get that. But that's not really, all you have to know is that that's the vertex is what we're talking about. So the max height is the y value when t equals whatever this number is. You would plug this t value, whatever decimal value you have there, up into the, the spots where t goes in your equation. And that would give you the h value, which that's what answer choice b, the max height, is talking about. But that's not what we need. We don't know anything about speed directly from the numbers in this problem. Speed is has to do with the um, rate of um, distance over time, in this case height over time, and the change in height over time. We don't know much about that, nor the max speed. So this is about knowing what you get in an equation like uh, ax squared plus bx plus c. All right, moving on. Um, 25 is another chart question. Charts are a huge part of this exam. And they ask you a weird question. They say, which best represents the, represent the relationship between x and k? Now, x is calories. Uh, x is equivalent to k kilojoules. OK, so in this case, 4 calories is equal to 16.7 kilojoules. Right. Likewise, 9 calories, this is from fat, 9 calories um, equals 37.7 kilojoules. And we have, yeah, we have the 4 again with carbohydrates. Okay, so we have to be careful here. X here in this first equation is 4. Right, so what I'm going to do, instead of trying to construct my own equation, I'm going to use these numbers. So when X is 4... K has to equal 16.7. So I should write K up here, kil kilojoules. So be careful. That's really what we're saying. I'm not going to create equations because equations give me a false sense of security and they create some confusion. So I'm just going to try out these values. Like, does, like, look, K is bigger than X. So I've got to multiply X times like something like 4. So A doesn't make any sense. Because if I put in x equals 4, 0.24 times 4 is not going to work. If I, b looks pretty darn good. c doesn't work for sort of the same reasons a doesn't work. If you put in k 
k equals 16.7 and multiply it by 4, you're not going to get back to x values like 4. And it's simply not true that 4 times 16.7 equals 4.2. x times k does not equal 4.2. So I've got rid of all my answers and I've got b. I grounded my work in using real values, right? Use the real values. Don't get abstract. Don't try to create equations if you don't have to. The equations are ultimately the answer choices. No need to try to create one on your own. It will only lead to confusion, right? I, I wrote this 4 calories equals 16.7 kilojoules. Sure, that's kind of an equation, but don't get confused about, like, is 4 the x or is calories x? And, you know, those are things that get confusing. So I would rather not use... Um, I would rather not use an equation in any real sense. So number 26 continues this discussion. Um, so 26 is a really challenging question. It says, and so what you want to do is first look at the answer choices and see what the differences are. The only differences are 9 over 4 and 4 over 9, P plus C, P minus C. P plus C, and there's also plus signs or minus signs next to the 9 fourths or 4 nines. Okay, so it's a bunch of signs and then just an inverse of 4 and 9. So record information as you get it. Um, don't stare at the problem. So 180 food calories, and that's total. And this is made up of P grams of protein, F grams of fat, and C grams of carbohydrates. Okay, and this equals 180, right? That's what that means. And all they want to do is get these things up away from each other, right? So this is calories. Let's go up to the chart again. You know, again, look at the test on your own. I'm going up to the chart here. This is tricky. But I think here, P, F, and C, so I hate building equations, but I know I have to work with the equations they've given me. So I tried at least, look, when I build equations, I never think that they're set in stone. I have this P, F, and C, and I'm wondering what the heck that means. Oh, these values represent grams. These are all grams. Okay, so up in the chart, we get this information about calories in a gram. And... 180 is not grams, that's calories. But these P, F, and C's are grams. So look, like four calories for every P gram, um, nine fat calories for every fat gram, and then four calories for every C carbohydrate gram. Right? The chart says energy per gram. So four calories in one gram of protein, nine calories in one gram of fat, four calories in one gram of carbohydrates. Um, and yeah, I'm just going down. Okay, so C is, uh, 180 is the calories. Okay, cool. Now I believe that I've got something here. And this makes sense with like, look, you knew you were going to have to use the fours and the nines somehow. They were in the answer choices, right? They're in every answer choice. So all I got to do is get F by itself now. So I would say first 9F, I'll subtract the other things over. So minus 4P, minus 4C, plus 180. Now, again, like here's the thing is you can notice the form of the equation, right? So, I mean, I'll deal with that in a second, but I'm going to divide by 9. So all this stuff just gets divided by 9. 4P, 4C, 180. Be very mindful of your signs because you know that the only mistake is signs, right? At this point, you see that the differences in answer choices have to do with pluses and minus signs. So look. I could first of all say, um, as I look at the forms of the equation, I guess I'll pull the negative 4 out for now. I'm not married to that idea. It would be P plus C then. So you multiply negative 4, you get your negative 4P, negative 4C. That's still over 9. And then 180, as it looks to be sort of divided by 9 separately, 180 divided by 9 gives you the 20. Okay, so if I got a negative 4 ninths and a positive PC, I'm cool. Okay, yep, so that's answer choice B. Now, by the way, I would be totally cool with saying 4 over 9 times negative P minus C. Like, that would be cool. But we don't have an answer that does both of those negative signs. So answer choice B is the right answer. 
tricky stuff. We're on the hard questions now, so feel free to ask me questions when you talk to me or in the video notes or anything, you know, comments, wherever you want. Um, 27, this is a little bit more straightforward once you've done some work on this exam, which is to say, look, this is about whether we have an exponential relationship or a linear relationship, right? We have T as a variable. Let me write 27 up here, just getting used to this new format, 27. Um, we have t as exponents in a and b and t as just an x value in c and d, right? So, I mean, I should say x value. You know what I mean. This is a linear situation in c and d, right? It's an exponential situation in a and b. So first of all, let's figure out what this 1.19, 1 1.019, 1 1.9 business is all about. I see that number in the problem, so I'll read that sentence. There's a growth rate of 1.9% per year. Okay, I know what that means. 1.9% is like, here's 1%, 1.01. So 1.019 would be the percentage we're talking about. Look, that makes answer choice B look kind of ridiculous, which says that's a 90% growth. That's, a, that's like every year you grow 90%. C says every year you grow 19%. So it's probably in between A and D, though I'm not absolutely certain of that. There may be something weird that happens. Probably not. Okay, it says there was 4 billion people in 1975. Which of the following represents the world's population in billions of people? So that means 4 in the question means 4 billion. Okay. So we're trying to grow that by a certain percentage each year. So look, when x is 0 or when t is 0, both of our equations a, we've already crossed off b and c, but a and d make sense because in both situations when t is 0, uh, p is 4. But when t is 1, right, when t is 1, we I think we don't, get what we want here. When t is 1 in answer choice d, we get 5.019. Now, I don't think that this represents 1% growth, like 1 point or 2%, roughly 2% growth, right? 2% of 4 billion is not an extra billion and change. Right, so 5.019 billion people, that means we increased by more than a billion from our starting point of 4 billion. 1 billion starting off of 4 billion is 25%. That's way too much growth. It's also just not the way that uh, percentage um, situations are set up over time. Right, in 10 years, answer choice D would make it seem as if we've got this like massive growth in people, whereas what we're looking for is 1% each of those 10 years, which is going to be significant, but it's not going to get us to like, you know, I guess 14 billion or something like that, right? So you could use your calculator, you could try out values like what happens in two years, I should see, you know, a little bit of growth, something like four or 5% growth. Okay, hopefully that's helpful. Feel free to ask me questions about that, but I'm going to move on to number 28, um, which is a linear graph and it asks for the ratio of t to s which is kind of a weird question but it says that t and s s and t is like x and y so i'll write down because i know x y confusion remember when you start a question if you can relate kind of like notice what could easily go wrong you're more likely to avoid a mistake x y is st so i've written it that way um they're positive integers what's the ratio of t to s this is weird, but look, here's what we know about this. I mean, you could probably just use 6 and 3, like 3 as the S value, 6 as the T value. I guess I, I'll just be thorough here just to show you what's up, but like we know there's a Y-intercept of 0, right? The graph goes through the origin. So MX plus B, but B is 0. So Y equals just MX. We can just put our points in for Y and X. So m times our x value of 3 has to equal the y value of 6. So now we know the slope. You know, right, that m's got to be a 2, right? So 2x is this equation. Now you can pick any points you want if you're uncomfortable with 6 and 3. It's all going to work out just the same. Pick x is 10. Of course, then y is 20. And if that's the case, the ratio of our y 
over our x 10 to 20 2 to 1 answer choice c notice of course it's really easy to mix up you know 2 1 1 2 right so do what you got to do to be certain there right you could say okay y is a 6 x is a 3 so y should be bigger than x so this the ratio should be bigger than 1 to 2 it should be bigger than 1 to 1 the y value the num the numerator of this fraction if we're thinking of the ratio as a fraction or the left hand value should be greater than the right hand value those are ways that you check your work with logic and you don't just rely on the math you've done hoping that you've done the math right 29 is a circle equation we want to know what's not on the interior of the line this is really about distances what the and knowing stuff about the circle formula so like number 29 we've got uh, a center at negative 3 positive 1 that's what that equation is telling us and a radius so this is the center sometimes we call that h and then the radius is 5 because the equation is x minus the center plus y minus the center equals radius squared so that's what we've got out of that equation um, signs are always the opposite of what you expect here so look the best way to probably think about this is to realize that this is a major time waster all I've got to do is know that my distance from the center to these points is greater than 5 that's when it would not be on the interior of the circle, right? We have like negative three, positive one. So like something like this. I wouldn't even, I'm like intentionally not drawing a nice circle. I have like a tool that would draw a nice circle here. But look, my point is like, you're looking for something that's outside these points. And I'm not making any like super strong uh, decisions about where the circle is, except I could probably say this, like five units from negative three, positive one. Okay, let me just say... Okay, from negative 3, positive 1, if I go 5 units this way, that's going to get me to 2, 1. I'll just go up and down a few points and see here. Like, 0, 0 is going to count then, right? Like, I'm pretty sure 0, 0 is going to work. And you know what? As I'm doing this, I'm realizing there's a way better way to do this, which is to say use the values in the equation and see if you get less than 25, right? That would be the best way to do this. But I wonder, I'll just continue with this method for a second. From negative 3, positive 1, if we went up 5 units, that's negative 3, 6. If we went to the left in a negative direction, 5 units, we would get to negative 8, positive 1. And then if we went down 5 units, we would get to x is still negative 3, y would be negative 4. Okay, so I'm pretty sure 3, 2 is going to be outside of this circle. Like 3, 2. Yeah, that's outside for sure. If I want to double check, I'll try the other ones. Like 3, negative 1 is definitely going to be in this circle because that's literally on the line from 3, 6 to 3, negative 4. It's like here. 3, 2 is out, but negative 3, 1, we just talked about negative 7, positive 3. That's questionable. You could try that out if you felt like it. 0, 0 is definitely looks... Again, it's kind of questionable, but it's probably in. If you don't want to rely on a graph, which you know I probably could have done this question algebraically and done more if you know how the equation works. So what I mean to say is, if these points are inside the circle, think about this equation as distance formula. It's like Pythagorean theorem. If we have a distance that's shorter than five to all of the points, then it's going to be it's going to work out as less than 25 in this equation. Um, the big idea is Pythagorean theorem is the distance formula, which is the circle formula. So you could try out these values and see. So like, for instance, let me just confirm with our value negative 7, 3. So if x is negative 7, we have in this equation, I'll do it over here, negative 7 plus 3 squared, and then 3 minus 1 squared. So I'm just calculating the distances between the point 7, 3, negative 7, 3, and the center 3, negative 3, positive 1. So I've just put it right into the formula. This is negative 4 squared is 16. This is 2 squared is 4. That's totally less than 25. So it's within the circle. You could do the same thing for the other points. For the sake of speed, I'm going to move on, but feel free to ask me questions about that if you'd like. Okay, so number 30 feels pretty innocuous when you look at it for the first time. 
It's like, how many subscriptions were sold in 2014? Cool, I've got 13 and 12, so I can do this. Be careful about the language. You know that number 30 is supposed to be hard, right? So take a moment to reflect on what the challenge is. They say in the this question, they say in the sentence pr- prior to the final question, the percent increase from 12 to 13 would be double 13 to 14. So it's slowing down. So you've got to see what the percent increase is from 12 to 13. Well, that's the difference over the starting place. So the difference between 5880 and 6, 5600 is 280. That over your starting place is the amount that you've grown as a percentage. And you could set this up as X over 100. You could literally just type this into your calculator and see what you get. I believe it's going to work out to 2%, I think. Um, 28 over 560. I think 28 times 2 is 56. So I think that's 2%. So assuming I'm right, which is a little dangerous, I would have used a calculator on the test, but assuming that I'm right, yeah, I feel good about that. Then the next year is going to be half as much growth. So 1% from 2013 to 2014. And you got to start in 2013 now, 5880, and you've got to gain 1%, which would be 588. Right? So that's 8. This is a 6. Carry the 1. This is 1314. Um and this is six four six eight. So if I've done that math right, and look, I would double check this a couple of ways. When I'm double, I mean, use your calculator. But like five hundred more than five thousand eight hundred would be six thousand three hundred, and then I would have an additional one hundred and sixty eight. So I feel good about my math. Answer choice D is the right answer here. The big concept is understanding how the word problem gives us this information. So this is from 2012 to 2013, and how to implement it. So if you're struggling with uh, percentage questions, my best advice is think about where you start. Where do you start? Um, okay, so I might, let me see if I have time to talk about if there's any of these grid that I feel like I really want to make sure I talk about. Um, I'll talk to you about the questions that you need to go over in our meetings if you're a student of mine. But I will talk about the two geometry questions just for good measure. Two of the questions that I see that are definitely about geometry. Um, hmm. Okay, so 34. You know what? Let's talk about 33 as well. So if a player answered, going right to the question, if a player answered 40 questions and scored a 50, how many questions did the uh, player answer correctly? Okay, so what I would do, now I'm going to read the first sentence, but what I'm going to do is throw numbers at this. I don't want to create an equation if I don't have to. Trivia game is obtained by subtracting the number of incorrect answers from twice the number of correct answers. Okay, well let's start with more, let's start with like uh, 30 questions correct. 30 out of 40 correct. That would mean 10 incorrect. Okay, so let's see. If you have 30 correct and you double that, that's 60, and you subtract 10, aha, boom. I probably subconsciously already knew that. That's why. But I just picked a number and saw if it worked. You're going to get two points for everyone correct and subtract one point for everyone incorrect. That worked out perfectly. How many answered correctly? 30. I would be on high alert for them asking me how many are incorrect because that would be a nice sneaky mistake. If 30 gave me more than 50 points, then I would know to go to lower numbers, you know, and if 30 gave me not enough points, less than 50 points, I would go to higher numbers, correct? Right? So don't bother making an equation when you don't have to. It gives a false sense of security and usually leads to mistakes. Okay, so the two geometry questions. First number, 34. The area of the shaded region, everything's proportional on circles. 100 degrees over the total degrees of 360 um, equals the area... Um, pi r squared uh, hmm oh so we just want this what fraction okay so 
we don't actually know the area of this circle, nor do we know like the radius or anything like that. So we're just left with this ratio. This is like the a part divided by the whole for both area and for arc length and you know the arc length as a proportion of the circumference, the segment area as a proportion of the total area. So it's just 100 over 360 in its simplest terms. Maybe reduce it to 10 over 36, which equals 5 over 18. And I think you could write that as a decimal too. Okay, cool. So that's a big idea, even though that question was pretty straightforward. Um, you know, I want to talk briefly about number 35 just in case. Um, Oh, no, I'm going to skip 35. I haven't talked about that one with students that much. So if you need help with that, let me know. I'm going to talk about 36 and 38. Okay, so 36 is this like triangle question. And the big idea is that if tan B is 3 over 4, you could write that as like, here's B. You could write opposite as like 3x. And you could write adjacent, opposite over adjacent is tangent, right? Toa. So that's, um, this is opposite, this is adjacent. Just making totally sure that I don't mess that up. Then, of course, you could call, likewise, for the bigger circle, this maybe 4y and this 3y. But look, the important thing is not all of that. It's that bc, which is this whole thing here, equals 15. And once I see that, and I know I have a 3, 4, 5, because 3, 4, this is going to be 5y. That's just the way I'm just noticing three, four, fives. I then know that 15 equals 5y, so y equals 3. You could call that your scale factor. That means this is 9. That means this is 16, right? And then if dA is 4, then the difference between 16 and 4 makes this equal 8, which means our scale factor here, our x value is 2. This is now 6, and this is 10. And what do they want to know? D, E. So that was just the 6, right? Sometimes they'll ask you what this length is, which would have been 5 from here to here. And I got that by just doing the difference between this value of 10 and this value of 15. But all they wanted was the 6. Okay, noticing 3, 4, 5s. All right, so I do want to talk about number 38 because the language in this question is important. So when you're asked difficult questions about proportions, in ratios, it usually won't be out of the grand total. In this chart, the grand total is 60 people. But there's a weird grammar thing happening in the in the sentence on number 38. It says, a contestant is selected at random. So you think, great, out of the total group, except it's not. It says, given at the end of the, there's like a parenthetical phrase. So let's, what is the probability that the selected student received a score of five on day two or three? given that the contestant received a score of five on one of the three days. So they're not totally random. It's random from the group who got a five. So the people who got a five, there's seven. And earlier in the passage, it tells you that nobody got the same score twice, I think. Um, yeah, it says that in the, um, the, the beginning of question 38. So there's seven total people who ever got a five. The people who got a five on day two or three is you know the group of two and the group of three that are listed under the cap column five. Five out of five, two of them on day two, three of them on day three, that's five people. There's our ratio. It's just an easy mistake to make with the grammar of that question. Okay, so I hope that's helpful. Um, please let me know any questions you have, either in the comments, you can email me, you can shout my name into the wind and hope for the best. Um, you can text me, whatever you wanna do. Get in touch. Let me know if you have any questions here. And if you're working with me on a weekly basis, uh, make sure you've notated these things. Go back and watch anything that you're confused about. Make notes about what you're confused about. Anything that you're seeing be active in your learning here so that when we get to the lessons, you can say, I got it. I see what's going on on number 38. And you can explain it to me. Or you can say, look, I see what you're talking about on 38 in these couple of ways, but I don't understand this whatever that is. Okay, hopefully that's helpful. Be active in your learning. Work hard, study hard. I promise you can improve your score on this test dramatically if you can notice these patterns. Thanks. Take care.